So I appreciate that. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, nice to see some of you this morning as I was uh, sitting in here at the end of the Bible study. I didn't know all of your names, those of you that I was talking to there, but some of the faces were familiar. And then as I came in here, uh, some of the names and faces I actually put together and, and had them. So uh, it's difficult when you travel around a bit and uh, meet some folks. But uh, good to be back in Texas. And I knew I was back as I was driving here. I saw the back of a pickup truck that had a big picture of a long rifle in the uh, pickup truck. And then I saw a guy with a uh, cowboy hat on as I was driving here. So I'm like, I'm back in Texas. So, so good to be here. Uh, greetings from up north. I'm enjoying your weather here. Uh, we've had some uh, a cold spell up there. And uh, we're just getting over it. Actually, it's about 60 degrees up in Washington, D.C. today. And again, I'm up a little bit north of there in Germantown, Maryland. I'm going to jump right into things today. And uh, if you want to chit-chat later, we'll, we'll do that after services. But I'm going to begin my message. And what I'm going to do to begin this message, I'm going to quote a couple of uh, individuals from an article that I got off the Internet. Uh, Evangelicals question the existence of Adam and Eve is the title of this particular article I was reading. Now this is somebody who's on our side of this particular uh, debate or battle. He, he agrees with, with us. And I, I believe Adam and Eve is a true story. I'm just going to put that right out there right from the beginning. But uh, let me give you some of the back and forth here between some of these evangelicals. Okay, People who believe in Jesus and other people who believe in Jesus, but they see Adam and Eve very differently. So one particular individual uh, mentions, without Adam, the work of Christ makes no sense whatsoever in Paul's description of the gospel, which is the classic description of the gospel we have in the New Testament. Now another fella, I'm going to quote this guy, Dennis Venema, at Trinity Western University. Uh, he says, if you read the Bible as poetry and allegory, as well as history, you can see God's hand in nature and in evolution, he says. Now again, I totally disagree with Mr. Venema's v viewpoint on this, but here's what he said, quoting him. There's nothing to be scared of here, Venema says. There's nothing to be alarmed about. It's actually an opportunity to have an increasingly accurate understanding of the world. And from a Christian perspective, that's an increasingly accurate understanding of how God brought us into existence. Now the article goes on. This debate over a historical Adam and Eve is not just another heady squabble. It's ripping apart the evangelical intelligentsia. So there's some smart people who are evangelicals who believe in the literal Adam and Eve, and there's some smart people who are evangelicals who are saying, no, no, we don't have to believe that literally Adam and Eve existed. Evangelicalism has a tendency to devour its young, says Daniel Harlow, a religion professor at Calvin College, a Christian reform school that subscribes to the fall in Adam and, of Adam and Eve as a central part of its faith. But Venema, a senior fellow at BioLogos Foundation, a Christian group that tries to reconcile faith and science, his group was founded by Francis Collins, an evangelical and the current head of the National Institutes of Health, who, because of his position, declined an interview. Venema is part of a growing cadre of Christian scholars who say they want their faith to come into the 21st century. Another one is John Snyder, who taught theology at Calvin College in Michigan until recently. He says it's time to face facts. There was no historical Adam and Eve, no serpent, no apple, no fall that toppled man from a state of innocence. Evolution makes it pretty clear that in nature and in the moral experience of human beings, there never was any such paradise to be lost, Schneider says. So Christians, I think, have a challenge, have a job on their hands to reformulate some of their tradition about human beginnings. Now, to the other side, one more quote, and then I'll get really get started. From my viewpoint, 
a historical Adam and Eve is absolutely central to the truth claims of the Christian faith, says Faisal Rana, vice president of Reasons to Believe, an evangelical think tank that questions evolution. Rana has a PhD in biochemistry from Ohio University. Now, especially to the young people in the audience, I want you to hear me today because most of the older folks, I hope, have already had this debate in their mind as far as smart people telling you one thing and other smart people telling you a different thing. But maybe the young people have not been exposed to this debate, this fight that they will be exposed to, especially if they go into the halls of our higher education institutions in the future. What I want to try to do today is get these young people to recognize that these ideas that are out there in the world saying that Adam and Eve is just a story, you don't have to believe in it, and you can still be a Christian, that's not something I believe, okay? Not at all. I believe you've got to take this whole book all together as God's Word, and when you start picking and choosing, you're going to run and fall down a slippery slope that is going to affect you and affect what your thinking is as a Christian. So to get things started, what I'd like to do is go back to Genesis and talk a little bit about what we see here. I'll give you some experiences from my own life, and I'm also going to get into some scripture that makes it abundantly clear that we can't pick and choose what scriptures we're going to believe and what scriptures we're not when it comes to the Bible. Now, when we go back into Genesis, a lot of the critics out there about the Bible, they definitely have a lot of criticism for the first 11 chapters of the Bible. So a lot of these people I was quoting from today, they consider themselves Christians, but they do have issues with the first 11 chapters of the Bible, more so than other parts of the Bible. And the reason they, they take that perspective is they think that some of these stories are mythical in nature and uh, you know, they provide what I think are bogus arguments for that perspective. But I want to read from Genesis chapter 2 and specifically we're going to start off in verse 8 here. And again, this, the title of this, script, this uh, sermon is Where is Eden? Again, just to get somebody's interest in this subject. Uh, but we're definitely going to uh, diverge from that particular title. So if we read Genesis 2, beginning in verse 8, let's read what it says. It says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. Now when you hear that word east, people are, are wondering, east of what? So the perspective when you're, when you're reading the Bible is somewhere east of Jerusalem is the perspective, is what most commentators believe as to why they use that, because... Jerusalem is the central location when we look at the Bible and uh, realize all the stories that are there. So, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there He put the man He had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now here's the part I'm going to focus on for the uh, beginning of this. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onks are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. That might sound familiar to some of you. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And again, that's another river that should be familiar to you if you think of modern day Iraq today. Now, just to get started here, when we look at what it's saying about Eden itself, notice that it is giving us some geographical markers. So we're familiar with the Tigris River, the Euphrates River. Now these other two rivers that are mentioned here, there's a lot of debate about what rivers those may have been and where they are today, and we'll touch a little bit upon that. 
But when you look at many of the myths of other religions, this isn't uh, a, a statement that is true in all cases, but in many of these other myths, what makes it mythical is the fact that many times they're not dealing with geographical locations that could be extant upon the earth. I won't say that in all cases, but that's one thing to understand about mythical stories different from stories that I believe are true, like this story we're reading here in the Bible. So that's one thing to mention uh, for you young folks as you begin to study these types of matters. But let's take a look now closely at what we're reading here in the Bible and see what some of the different uh, folks who are studying this particular subject have to say. Uh, one of the books I was consulting for some of this material is titled From Eden to Exile by Eric Klein, in case any of you want to do further research, and some other sources, and I'll be mentioning some of that as, as we go along. But let's talk about these four rivers. Now, we've got an idea where the Tigris and Euphrates are today, and again, most people, when you think about where was Eden or where could it have been, uh, Mesopotamia is number one at the top of the list as to where civilization may have began. And a lot of that stems from the fact that we know where the Tigris and Euphrates are today. A problem that folks have when they study this is looking at these other rivers, the Pishon River and the Gihon River that are mentioned here, and there are lots of ideas about that. Now you have the mentioning here of the land of Havila with the Pishon River. Again, there's a problem when you look into the land of Havila. There's argument as to where that may be. Uh, some conjecture southern Arabia, but that's merely a hypothesis. From about the 5th century until the Renaissance, some thought that the Gihon and the Pishon were the Niles and the Ganges. I've got some issues with that when you think of where Egypt is on the map and where India is on the map and where Mesopotamia and the Tigris and Euphrates are. But I just want to offer this information to our younger folks to show you all the different ideas that are out there about all kinds of different things. And if you just listen to one source, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And that goes for the church also, unless it's the Bible, all right? When you say, well, this guy says this about the Holy Days, and that guy said that about the Holy Days, or the calendar, or whatever it issue it is that we are debating about, you got some trouble if you're just putting all your eggs in that particular individual's basket. You want to look at all of these various sources, especially if you're going to really get into this and study it, rather than running off with one that seems to fit where your particular mindset is at that particular time. What I do is I want to start with the Bible, okay? Use this information first as you begin to look at what others are saying about things that pertain to biblical information. Because it's going to come down to faith in the end, folks, okay? Faith is very important in this whole thing because when we're dealing with human authorities, folks, let me say that again, human authorities, scholars, PhDs, folks, I've been through some higher education schools, okay? And I'll tell you a story about that a little bit later that hopefully will have you understanding that they're just human beings like you and me. And they make mistakes, they have agendas, they have ways of seeing the world that are limited from their perspective of life. Don't ever think, this guy's the teacher, this guy's the authority, he must know more than me. No, stick with the Bible and what it says. That's going to get you where you need to go. Don't worry about this authority or that authority, folks, because they're all human. They're sinners. They make mistakes. They make errors. But I remember being in high school and a kid coming up to me by 10th grade. Dr. Bowen says evolution is how we got here. And all the kids were talking about it. And I was like, what? What's going on here in my high school? You know, that was my first real exposure to evolutionary theory. One of the, the, the teachers at my high school was really pushing evolution, trying to get the kids to think that they came from pre-existent uh, monkey-type beings that formed into man. 
So that was my first exposure to that, and a lot of the kids were taken by this because it was a teacher, and the teacher supposedly knows better than me, but uh, hopefully we'll put that idea to rest here today as we get into this. But getting back to these rivers, the Pishon and the Gihon, I talked a little bit about those. Again, we're not sure what those rivers are today. I'm going to look at a little more information on those in a moment. The Tigris, in some Bible translations, you will find it mentioned as Hedekel, but that's merely a transliteration of the Hebrew. As you, as you put that into the English, it is the Tigris River that is mentioned here, and most people know where that is today, and also the Euphrates River, uh, which is mentioned here, again, in modern-day Iraq, uh, as we look on the map today. Now, remember, there was a worldwide flood it's at one point uh, in our history, uh, what happened to those other rivers? Something may have happened with that flood. Uh, exactly how the Tigris and Euphrates are flowing today may have been a little bit different back then, but uh, we believe we can at least find those two rivers in our understanding of the geography of what is being uh, written down here in the book of Genesis. Now, again, this concept that uh, Eden must have been somewhere near the Tigris and Euphrates or at the beginning or ending of the Tigris Euphrates. Uh, that's what most scholars, conservative scholars, will tell you when they're reading Genesis, uh, those who believe in the record of Genesis. What I'm going to do now is just for kicks give you some other ideas that are out there, other scholars who are looking at this subject, and give you some of the reasons. And the reason I'm doing this, especially for the young people, is to show you how certain ideas get people going in a certain direction, and then that becomes their, their baby, you know, that they fly with that particular idea. And just to show you the variety of ideas that are there. So don't get, go, don't get scared by your professor in college if you get to college, or your biology teacher in high school telling you that evolution is the answer, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because a lot of these folks are just like everybody else. Uh, they can make mistakes and they can be wrong. So let's look, uh, before we do that, let's talk a little bit more about the ancient uh, area of Mesopotamia. And uh, many of you have heard of the Sumerians, right? You've heard of the Sumerians who were an ancient people. And we've got a little bit of information because they were one of the uh, more ancient peoples that we have a record of. And uh, going back to the third millennium BC, these folks lived in Mesopotamia and they did have a word for Eden in their language. Uh, they may have received this word from earlier people who translated the word, and uh, it was thought of as a fertile plain. And when you read the description in your Bible of what Eden was like, a lush jungle environment, that idea of a fertile plain can definitely fit in there. The Sumerians also had a paradise myth about a land of plenty called Dilmun, and scholars, some scholars, connect this particular area with modern-day Bahrain today. So again, uh, we aren't going to get into the details of that. Another reason why Mesopotamia is highly thought of as the cradle of civilization, and again, the Tigris and Euphrates are there, Mesopotamia, again, Greek, the meso means in the middle, Potamia, Potamia means rivers, so between the rivers and the middle of the rivers, most of the people who study the subject of where early civilizations came from say that the domestication of animals, irrigation, and agriculture probably began in Mesopotamia. Once again, that fits in with what the Bible is telling us about where civilization started. Now, you'll hear the argument from the evolutionists out there that, that it began in Africa, and then they moved towards Mesopotamia. But they are going under the premise that those pre-human ape-like beings that they are digging up were our ancestors, which we don't believe, okay? So again, we believe that things, the possibility of a gap theory and things of that nature, I'm not going to get into that discussion right now, but that's why there's this fight between where did civilization begin uh, most believe that real civilization, city, city states, irrigation, agriculture, the domestication of animals began in Mesopotamia, and that's, that's right in line with your Bible, folks. 
that's right in line with your Bible. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of these other theories out there about where Eden may have been. One particular theory, uh, I'll put these in order of uh, what, what most people think is possible rather than not possible. And again, Mesopotamia is my pick somewhere in there because the Tigris and Euphrates connection. But some say the Persian Gulf region, and again, the Tigris and Euphrates kind of flow out into that. Um, you also have the uh, island of Bahrain. If there was a worldwide flood, could that land have been flooded? Um, there's a lot of swampy areas within Mesopotamia around the Persian Gulf and Iraq and places like that. Could some of that have been flooded wherever this location was? I'll give you one fellow's name if you want to look into this. His name is Juris Zarens. He's a professor of anthropology at Southwest Missouri State University. And uh, he talks about this Persian Gulf near Bahrain theory. Uh, about those other rivers, his particular take on it is those rivers may have dried up. And that's why we don't know where they are today. Another fella who's involved in that type of thinking is Ephraim Spicer. Uh, professor at the University of Pennsylvania in Oriental Studies, and uh, he gets into some of that thinking uh, similar to Mr. Zarin's here. A second idea is the Arabian Peninsula. And again, if you're looking on your map, you know, all this is, is nearby. You're kind of next to each other here when you talk about the Persian Gulf, then the Arabian Peninsula. So this particular idea, uh, one proponent is James Sauer, a professor, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania uh, and also Harvard. And uh, he talks about a partially underground sand river channel that leads from the mountains of Hejaz to Kuwait. So again, he, he's got this idea that uh, some of these riverbeds may have dried up over time. And uh, he thinks that this may have dried up between 3500 and 2000 B.C., and he thinks that might have been the biblical Pishon River that is described. Now, what evidence does he use to support that? Because I'm just, he's just making that statement, but here's some of his evidence. As we read in Genesis 2 about the bedillium, the resin that's mentioned there, the onx stone, which are mentioned there, both of those are found a lot in the country of Yemen, which is down at the bottom of Saudi Arabia. It's the country at the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula. So you do have a lot of, of those items there. And then the mention of the gold of the land being good, once again, there is a gold deposit in this dried up sand river that uh, Mr. Sauer is uh, talking about in that area of the Arabian Peninsula. A third idea, uh, this one is proposed by British archaeologist David Roll. Uh, he put this in his 1998 book, Legend, The Genesis of Civilization. Uh, he's looking at Iran as his location. And once again, uh, you know, it's in the general area there that we've been talking about. And uh, he mentions the two rivers being possibly in Iran. He has this idea of some rivers in Iran that might be those rivers. And another piece of his information has to do with the land of Nod, which we read about in Genesis. There's a place name in Iran that is Nakdi, which he thinks could be a relation to the land of Nod. But again, you've got to be careful when you use place names today that deal with place names from many years ago. Uh, there were other places called Eden. There were other places called Cush that you're going to read about and learn about in your Bible other than the the major ideas that we have on Eden, Cush, and places like that. So you got to be careful with that place naming uh, theory when you start to look at these types of things. I'll give you another example, okay? you, you got enough examples of where Eden might have been. This particular idea is that it, it's in Egypt. And most of this comes from the idea that evolutionists have that Africa is the cradle of civilization. So as pre- human man, which I don't believe in, okay, I believe God made us as we are, okay, we didn't come from monkeys, but those who propose this say that as pre-human man began to migrate out of Africa, he got into Egypt, and there's a uh, tradition in Egypt on the, off the Nile River near Heliopolis that that is where Eden began, and uh, there are some proponents of that particular theory. Uh, 
Again, they say, well, what about the Tigris and Euphrates, you might be asking, because aren't they a little distance from Egypt? Yes, they are. So the theory goes that during the Babylonian captivity, the writers of the Bible added Tigris and Euphrates to the Genesis account once they were over in Babylon and were experiencing where the Tigris and Euphrates were. So again, you, when you look at these theories, folks, young people especially, you've got to look into these theories. <laughs> Don't just believe the high school biology teacher. Don't just believe the college professor because he's telling you this or that. You got to look in, study, and show yourself approved, as the word says. And when you begin to look at some of this stuff, you start rubbing your head and, and wondering, well, that's, I don't know about this one. You know, that seems a little far off. One final theory that I will get to here is Turkey, that somewhere in Turkey, again, Tigris and Euphrates, you can see them touching the land of Turkey. Uh, you also will find that in the biblical record, when you go through the first 11 chapters, Mount Ararat, uh, Noah, where Noah landed, places like this, uh, Ur of the Chaldees, those places were in the area of Mesopotamia, southern Turkey, so uh, that's another theory that is out there. Now, the reason I wanted to go all through those various theories was just to tell you that we don't know exactly where Eden was, okay? So my, my title today, Where is Eden, is I don't know where Eden is, okay? And here's the deal. It doesn't matter where Eden was, okay? It doesn't matter where the Ark of the Covenant is right now. It, all those things, what really matters is what? Is what? You know what the answer is is are you obeying God? Are you following His law? Are you living the life that Jesus led on this earth? That's what you got to be doing in this world. And, and I love studying, I love reading, I love all that sort of thing. So continue to do it, but let's understand what's the priority, folks. And let's not get off track in worrying about all these philosophical ideas and things that we concern ourselves with that take us away from actually living life, having relationships with people, helping people out, living a love sort of life rather than worrying about this, that, or the other thing. Now having said all that, what do we need to believe? I believe we need to believe that Adam and Eve were real people that they existed, that they are the progenitors of the entire human race. And I'm going to get to why I believe that in a moment. But let me give you another quote by a guy named Robert Alter. He wrote the five books of Mose. And here's what he says. Again, he's, he's pushing you know, this, this, the Bible, but he's got a different take on it. The primeval history, in contrast to what follows in Genesis cultivates a kind of narrative that is fable-like or legendary and sometimes residually mythic. So, of course, he's getting into this idea that, hey, you can believe that some of the Bible is myth, you can believe some of it is allegory, and don't get me wrong, I know there's some symbolism in the Bible, folks, but when it comes to Adam and Eve, I believe that that has to be understood as being literal, and I'm going to tell you why, as we start to look at some other scriptures in the Bible. And we need to look at the whole Bible before we come up with ideas about what we are going to believe about that Bible. But again, as I said before, here's a quote from Mr. Spicer, who I mentioned earlier. To the writer of Genesis 2.8, so this is the opposite of what Alter is saying, okay? Spicer says this, To the writer of Genesis 2.8, the Garden of Eden was a geographic reality. So once again, two intelligent individuals looking at the Bible, looking at the same scriptures, one saying, oh, the Eden story's a myth. The other saying, hey, whoever was writing this is talking about geographical place name locations that are real. He obviously was thinking of this as a literal thing that we needed to believe in. Just to show you there are so many different ways and beliefs out there, even within the Christian community, that are very opposite of um, what people think. Now, just a couple more things before we start to get to some Scripture. And that's what I wanted to focus on. What is Scripture saying about Adam or Eve or Eden? Other Scriptures in your Bible. 
Now, before I do that, though, let's just talk about this concept of Adam and Eve, Eden being a myth, just for a moment. And I had a conversation with a woman at work recently, and we talked a little. I don't get to talk much about religion at work. Usually when I bring up religion at work, people kind of walk the other way, or they just nod their heads and quiet down. They don't say anything anymore. So I don't often get to get into uh, religious conversations at work. But I did have this one conversation recently. We were talking a little bit about Genesis, and uh, the woman said to me, how could, how could a, ma a woman be made out of a rib? Okay, and I said, well, God is God, okay? If you believe there's a God, and I'm not sure where she's at on God, but if you believe God is a supernatural being, folks, God can do whatever He wants, right? So why is it such a big deal that He's going to make woman out of a rib? But here's an interesting thing. Do you know that chest surgeons, when they open people up, they sometimes will open them up and take part of a rib off. Now you might think that's not a good idea, but do you know that ribs can partially grow back? In some cases, they can fully grow back. Look that up. Study that subject, and you will find that to be the truth. Now isn't that interesting that God took a rib from the man to make this woman? Okay, because hey, Adam's going to be running around without out of a rib. Oh, maybe it's going to come back because of the nature of the rib. Another thing that we see back there in Genesis, and this isn't a sermon on all of Genesis, but just for my young friends out here who may not be aware of this. When the Bible says man was made from the dust of the ground, man was made from the dust of the ground, Genesis 2, verse 7. Do you know there are 41 chemicals in the earth that are part of your body, folks? <laughs> you are from the dust of the ground. <laughs> Let's be literal about it. Let's get real with this, okay? Interesting, interesting when you look at this. Now, let's get back to where we were here. What I want to do right now is talk to you about a little story, a little incident I had in college. And uh, I was going to Georgetown University. I was getting a master's degree. My job was paying for me to go to school, so I had to take international relations type classes. One of the classes I could take, though, was a religion angled class on salvation within various religion, religious traditions, within Hinduism, within Buddhism, within Christianity and Judaism. What did these different religions think about salvation? Now in this class, the instructor, I don't know how he got on this subject, but he started talking about the birth narratives in the Bible, in Matthew and Luke. And he was saying, well, even the Bible, you can't rely on the Bible, is basically what he was saying to the class, because Matthew says this about the birth of Jesus, and Luke says this about the birth of Jesus. Now what he was saying was, if you read those two birth narratives, that uh, the shepherd showed up when Christ was in the manger, and the, the wise men came, if you read it closely, uh, within two years of Jesus' birth. And you'll see that when you read it. It's very plain in the Bible as to what it's saying. But he was pushing the idea, which you will find in books that criticize the Bible, that there's two birth narratives, they're different, you can't rely on the Bible. So I put my hand up and I said, uh, wait a minute, sir. Uh, I think you, you, you don't have all the details on it. I said something like that. Now, it's not good to tell a college professor, I don't know if this guy had a PhD or whatever, but it's not good to tell a college professor he might not know something, okay? I learned that. So uh, I said, I think you're, you got that wrong, sir, because I told him in Luke, it's talking about within two years, the mad guy got the hair, and he says, I'm going to kill babies two years and younger. He wanted to kill babies two years and younger because we assume that the Magi were not there on the actual birth date. They got there within that time frame of two years, and you'll read that they went to a house to see him where the others saw him in a manger, the shepherds who were there on the night within the uh, account in Matthew. So I, I said this to him, and he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. But he gave me a look. He gave me a look that I didn't like, okay? He gave me a look that I, and everybody else in class was kind of looking at me. Oh, what's, what's this guy saying, okay? So later in that class, here's why I knew he didn't like that. Later in that class, he was explaining something to the class. And for whatever reason, he took off his shoe to explain it. 
And he said, yeah, it was over there. And he threw his shoe all the way across the room. And I'd say I was about where Mr. Reedy is right now. I was about that far away from him on the opposite side of the room. He could have just tossed his shoe to make the point. But he threw it all the way in my direction, folks. It bounced about a foot from me. Okay, I felt like George Bush when the Iraqis were throwing shoes at him. You know, This did not hit me. But I got like a feeling like, I don't like you, buddy. Okay? Now, I say that for this reason. This guy was a big Georgetown University. If you want to teach at Georgetown, you better know your stuff, folks. And he didn't know that the two birth narrative stories, the difference between those two birth narrative stories. And he didn't like, he didn't like that I was telling him something different in front of everybody else. Just to let the young folks know that he's just human. And I'll tell you what, he's probably intellectual greater than I am. I got no issues with that, okay? I don't doubt that at all. But he didn't know his Bible as well as I hope you know your Bible. It's a very simple thing to see that difference between those two narratives and what's really going on there. And all the criticisms of the Bible I've read over the last 30 years, I found arguments against those criticisms that make sense for me. I believe in this Bible wholeheartedly. I stake my life on it. And you've got to have that commitment to this. You've got to be there with this book. You've got to get to that point. That's what your Christianity is all about. Now, why do I say that with such conviction? Let's look at what the Bible has to say about Adam and Eve in the garden very quickly. And I'm not going to address every scripture, but let's look at a few of these. So other than Genesis, other than Genesis, and it's hard to go back to the beginning because there was no written history back then. There was no archaeology back then, folks. You know that archaeologists said at one time, there was no historical David. You know why they said that? They didn't find any inscriptions about David in digging up all the old uh, places in the Middle East until they found him one day, and they don't say that anymore. So keep that in mind as we look at this. Isaiah 51 and verse 3. Are the other writers of the Bible confirming the truth of Eden and Adam and Eve? Isaiah 51 and verse 3. Let's see what we find here. Isaiah 51, 3. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and the sound of singing. The garden of the Lord, Eden, he's describing it as being beautiful, fantastic, versus this desert environment that he's uh, talking about on the other side of this. So definitely the writer of Isaiah believed in this garden of God. Ezekiel 28. And verse 13, this scripture is probably familiar to many of you. Ezekiel 28 and 13. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onks, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. A lot of stuff we can comment on there, but I don't have time to do that. The emphasis I'm, I'm making on this scripture is the garden of God, Eden, is, is talked about by the prophet Ezekiel here. Another source. When we look at Joel, the prophet Joel, if we go back to the prophet Joel and take a look at what he had to say, we will find something there. So let's take a look at our friend, the prophet Joel, and see if he had anything to say on this subject. Oh boy, always, always get, have trouble with Joel. I don't get them in the order that they, uh, there we go. Okay, Joel chapter 2 and verse 3. Listen to what it says. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. So we know what he's talking about, the day of the Lord. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was of old, nor ever will be in ages to come. That's verse 2. Verse 3. Before them fire devours, behind them a flame blazes, before them the land is like the Garden of Eden, so that particular picture versus behind them 
a desert waste. So again, the Garden of Eden, lush, tropical environment. Uh, and here there's a desert to com compare and contrast those two locations that he's describing here uh, during the day of the Lord. But once again, another source, another source in your Bible confirming his belief in this Edenic paradise. Now, some Christians say, well, I only care about the New Testament. I only care about the New Testament. Well, let's take a look at the New Testament. Let's find a few scriptures over there. Luke chapter 3 and verse 38. This is a big one, folks. This is very important when you think about the context in which we're reading here. This is the genealogy of Jesus in Luke chapter 3. And we can pick it up in verse 23. It says, now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat. Now you begin to read who all these individuals' fathers were, and it takes you back, it takes you back, it takes you back, until you get to the end of chapter 3, and I'll read that verse to you, verse 38. The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam... The Son of God. So within the genealogy of your Savior, Christians, okay, you Christians out there teaching at Christian universities who don't believe that Adam and Eve is a true story, that it's a myth, it's an allegory, it's a nice thing to keep in mind, but it's not true. You believe in Jesus Christ. I know you do. I know they do. And here in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, you have Adam at the beginning of that genealogy and God being his father. That's heavy, folks. That's big. When you're picking and choosing scriptures, there's a problem here because Adam's in that genealogy. I believe Adam was my first physical earthly father in the sense that the Bible is relating that right here. Romans 5 and verse 14. It's all over the New Testament. It's all over the New Testament. I can't understand how these evangelicals cannot believe the story of Adam and Eve was literal when you have all of this background information within the Bible supporting it, yet they believe that Jesus died and rose again. Romans 5 and verse 14. Romans 5 and 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam. That's not another Adam, folks, okay? It's talking about the Adam in the book of Genesis from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam. Can't deny who that Adam is, okay? It's all about him and Eve sinning in the garden. As did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. Now, who's writing Romans? The Apostle Paul. Who did Paul learn from? If you believe the story in your New Testament, which I do, and I hope you do too, Paul got knocked off that horse going to Damascus. Who was preaching to him? Jesus Christ was teaching him. So he got it right from the source. And then he wrote, he wrote these various books in the New Testament that had to do with what he was learning from Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Let's go to another one, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the, surf, by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Isn't that apropos for what we're discussing right now? That our minds, just like Eve was deceived, in, in, uh, intelligent people in this world today, their minds are being deceived by the serpent. He is, he's tough. He's tough. He does a great job of deception out there. He's got Christians believing Adam and Eve wasn't a true story. And they're teaching it and preaching it in their congregations. They're telling them, oh yeah, it's okay, we could, we could have come from evolution. We could have come from evolution. If we came through evolution, folks, there's a lot of issues with the rest of the Bible. There are many issues, and I can't even get into that right now. But there's a problem if you're a Christian and you believe you came from a primordial soup 
millions and billions of years ago. I don't know how long they want to go back. Do you know the mathematical chances of that occurring? The mathematical chances of all the life we have on today with all the complexity coming from a primordial soup in the ocean that just started it is an infinitesimal to not be believable, that there could not be a chance of that happening according to the math. And I'm not a math guy. You can ask Larry about that maybe. He's more into accounting or, and things like that. But I'm not a math guy, but that's what mathematicians are saying when they look at this type of thing. Intelligent guys who agree with what, what our perspective is on these scriptures. 1 Timothy 2, 13. Again, another book in your Bible. Paul, Paul mentions Adam and Eve a few times here, folks. 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14. 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14. Let me find it here. 1 Timothy 2, 13. Here we go. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Once again, he's mentioning those two names. We know who those two names are. They aren't a new Adam and Eve, folks. They're Adam and Eve from the book of Genesis. There are other mentions of Adam and Eve within the New Testament. There are other mentionings of Eden within your Old Testament. I don't have time to address all of them in this discussion today. But here, here's the point I want to make. You know, I started off talking to the young people out there, the, the young people who maybe haven't worked this debate through in their brain yet. Please, before you come to a final conclusion, Make sure you talk to elders within the church. Make sure you are reading various sources. Make sure you're reading your Bible and knowing what's really in there before you make decisions about whether or not you're going to believe this or you're going to believe that or believe uh, what your college professor is telling you. Because don't ever forget that there is a force in the world working on the minds of humans Okay, Satan, the devil, and his minions, they are out there. It's real. It's real. Many people don't believe that Satan is real. They don't believe there's demons out there trying to influence your mind. The prince of the power of the air. The air. Where's the air, folks? Okay, that air could be right around here. That air could be in your brain. You know there's space between the atoms that make up your body? There's space in there when you start, start to study quantum physics and find out how interesting the physical realm really is. It blows your mind. The idea there could be other dimensions right around us. That's scientific stuff scientists are talking about today. You know, that's not just in your Bible. Quantum physics is touching upon that. And it, it blows you away if, if you read up on this stuff and then know what your Bible says. It all makes sense. It clicks and comes together. So I'll leave you with this. I'll leave you with this in this discussion that we had today. Don't doubt that I, I, those of us here at the Church of God International teach and preach that Adam and Eve were real human beings who lived on planet Earth and we come from them. They were our original father and mother. So, so don't worry about what the intelligentsia of society are saying in the schools of higher learning. Go to your Bible, learn from it, grow from it, use that as your bedrock foundation that you're going to base all other knowledge on. And I'll leave you finally with this scripture that I love, love to uh, go back to in, in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. It says this, now all has been heard, okay, we heard about all these different ideas, all these different matters pertaining to this subject today. All's been heard. Here's what, here's what really matters, folks. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments.